Hi, everyone, and welcome to the EBA webinar series. My name is Aaron Smith. I'm the CEO of EBA. I'm joined by Nancy Bakeman, our Executive Vice President, and we're really pleased to present part two and Doug Terry from Doug Terry Homes in Toronto presenting on From Bleeding Edge to Leading Edge, A Builder's Guide to Net Zero Homes. Today, many of you have been at EBA for a long time. You know, we've always talked about house as a system, but Doug will be diving more deeply into house as a system and a holistic approach. If you haven't seen part one, you can go back on the EBA Academy and watch part one. And this will be a total five part series. Uh, Doug, next slide, if you could. And um, I, of course, am Aaron Smith, but uh, it, it's a really exciting time at EBA. It's a really exciting time for all of us that are high performance builders and developers. Uh, we've got a community of 50,000. I don't think we've updated this in a while, right, Nancy? It's probably up to about 70,000 in the community. Uh, builders and stakeholders, great energy raters, architects, designers, um, you know, even a lot of homeowners and remodelers that are coming on and saying, how do we, and Doug calls it kick it, but I call it healthy homes, electrified homes, resilient homes, decarbonized homes, just because I'm an old hockey player and it's easier for me to remember. But our stakeholders are really at the forefront. I think you know, across North America, our time has come. Um, you all are truly the early adopters and the innovators. And we're all driving sustainable transformation, but really no one more so than Doug. So Doug, we're really pleased to spend this time with you today, learning from you. And like you said, from all of your great experiences over the year. And where do many of us that are, you know, 10 years behind you or five years behind you or 15 years behind you, where's the best place for us to start as we uh, go after this mission? So I'll turn it over to you. Oh, excellent, Aaron. Thanks so much. And, you know, really... Part of this is about getting all boats to rise together. We just need to get a whole lot more of us being able to do this a lot faster. That's also part of why I, I decided to write the book. I'll get into that in just a little bit of a second, but let's uh, let's just have a quick peek and see who's on the line here. I think you've got a question set up here, uh, looking yeah. for what people's occupation is here. So are we a builder, an architect, designer? Uh, are we an energy rater, trade contractor? Are we in manufacturing and sales? Are we a, a government uh, member or are we other? So, And if you do click other, go ahead and chat to Doug and I. We'd love to hear what um, category you're in and uh, and where you're from. You know, feel free. Uh, we also have the Q&A section open. I'll be asking questions to Doug throughout the presentation. So feel free to put your questions in there. Uh, let's see. Uh, builders and architects, number one. Manufacturer sales, number two. That's great. Uh, we got one other, one energy rater, um, a trade contractor. Welcome. So really nice mix, Doug. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. We'll keep it on going here. Who, who the heck am I? I probably, that's why I put my names on my shirt, Aaron, so I don't forget who I am. You know? <laughs> um, so I'm the president of Doug Terry Homes. I'm actually out of St. Thomas, Ontario. We're not from the center of the universe, otherwise known as Toronto. Uh, we were about two hours. We're halfway between Buffalo and Detroit, actually, if you string a, a line between. Uh, I am past president of Ontario Homeowners Association, uh, currently Ontario Homeowners Technical Chair, although I think I'm giving that up in a couple of weeks. Uh, I'm also a member of the Canadian Homeowners, uh, both CHPA Net Zero Council and Technical Research Councils. So I am a bit of a code geek, I'll admit it. Uh, 2019, I was inducted into the uh, member of the year for CHPA and into the Inter Quality Hall of Fame here in Ontario. And uh, I'm also a humanitarian mission leader. We'd like to go and do some playing elsewhere. Um, I'm a second generation builder. Our company was established in 1954. I did not name it after this myself. And in fact, I didn't name myself after myself. My dad did both of those. So I'm actually junior and the company is now named after him. We actually won uh, the inaugural award for CHBA's Net Zero Home of the Year a few years ago. And, uh, and this is actually the house we did it. We wanted to prove that it could just be something that looked like it belonged in a subdivision without people really noticing anything different. Uh, we are a three times, uh, actually three P, Natural Resources Canada Energy Star Builder of the Year. And uh, we were the first builder to build and label 200 plus homes in the in, in net zero, uh, CHBA net zero program. Uh, pretty cool. So we've, we've uh, been there, done that. A couple of the t-shirts don't fit anymore because of COVID, but hopefully we'll get that taken care of. And this I always like to share is the best reason ever for wanting to do something to improve uh, our planet and try and make sure that we've got something left for the grandkids. That's my grandbaby Corbin, otherwise known as mini me. So he's a big reason why I'm really motivated to share what I know with people. Mm -hmm. 
So today, Aaron, uh, we're going to talk about reviewing houses of system part one. We're going to talk about house design, uh, energy modeling, what's your air tightness plan, choosing the optimum wall, uh, water, water everywhere, and looking at solar and installs. Now, a really important point as I get into this is that when we look at holistic design houses of system and how we design and build, if you don't have a good water management plan and you don't have a good air tightness plan, don't go forward because mm. adding more insulation onto a bad strategy is going to cause you grief. So we are right. going to cover those in detail today. Okay. Great. So it's also, it's a holistic approach to planning. Uh, we want to consider the impacts of the whole home. So things like mul multiple bunko bump outs are going to add dollars and complexity to the home. We want it to look great because we want to understand where bias buyer is and we want them to be attracted to it. But we do want to be careful about the complexity we add into the homes as well. The other thing is, is that more hands touching uh, the challenging details really increases the chance of a failure, right? So right. we have to keep that in mind. And then we're going to look at some design review critical steps. So first of all would be your planning meeting. You want to look at your energy performance and how that's going to work uh, and what you intend to achieve. Now, when you're doing that, keep in mind, we're also talking about um, air tightness and water management plants having already been figured out. This is the first part. This first meeting is when your team, it's like a charrette. You're going to want to get together and try and really tear your plans apart. Look at all the components that need to be changed, uh, how many of these components interact with each other and how they impact upon each other. So for example, like I said, having multiple bump outs or cantilevers or the exterior walls, uh, that's going to add cost, but it also adds complexity for air sealing, water management, and getting the insulation just right. So that's additional detailing that has explained, uh, it has to be explained to your framer, your insulator, siding contractor, and also pretty much anybody that touches the, uh, the, the walls of the home, putting holes through it have to be looked at. And so we're, we're going to get into that a bit today. So um, we already covered a little bit about uh, the four principles that I have of modern design. So when we're looking at this stuff today, that's keeping that lens on it as well. You know, are we looking at indoor air quality? Are we looking at carbon reduction? Are we looking at climate resiliency? And are we looking at occupant comfort? Now, next week's session, we're gonna finish off with a bit of a deeper dive on carbon uh, and some of the work we've been doing with our modelers to see what it looks like. But there's the 11 basic critical steps that I consider for when you're looking at design aspects of the home. Uh, your house design review, your water management, your energy modeling, I'm looking at targeting for under one air change. That's that's what we've kind of set as our benchmark. Uh, and, surveying your room. And Doug, range. that's the that's the requirement for zero energy ready too, right? It is, right? Yeah. So why would we set it higher than right. that if that's the goal, right? right? Yeah. And so we'll talk about some solutions that can get you there if you're struggling with it. Uh, here's one that, guys, I really see struggle with a lot is surveying your roof. You know, all of a sudden you're releasing a subdivision of houses and you haven't even looked at your roof yet. So we actually spin our roofs in, in eight circles of the compass to make sure worst orientation works. And we do that for every home. And then once you've got that, if you will, Aaron, in the bag, then you know you can kind of safely go forward with, uh, with creating your, your, your lot assembly, right? Uh, we are gonna talk about choosing the optimum wall assembly. We're gonna look at basement walls. They're a lot of fun uh, for you guys to do basements. We do some crazy stuff up here in Canada I'll talk about. Uh, radon and sub-slab insulation, we've got to cover that off. Window selections, that's a critical piece like we talked mm -hmm. about last week. Yeah. Uh, HVAC sizing and design, we're going to do a bit of a dive into that over the next two, two sessions. Ventilation and humidity control and then water conservation. So that's kind of the, the pick list for the next this session and the next one. And Doug, I think one thing that's fascinating for the audience is, you know, having known you for a couple of years now, two of these areas you've kind of brought in-house somewhat now or are bringing in-house, maybe three, right? So on your HVAC and on your uh, air tightness, um, you have purchased some subcontracting capability through uh, Aero Barrier. Yeah, yeah. We're going to we're going to talk about Aero Barrier yeah. today too. Yeah, fantastic. Um, yeah. Well, the HVAC it's uh, an HVAC's in the next session, but just really brief. Um, we could not get sizing under control with our HVAC contractors, so we yeah. actually took the design part in house and then went and found an HVAC contractor and said, "This is what you're going to do," because everybody was screwing it up. And one of the worst mistakes that I see happen, Aaron, is they don't get the air tightness numbers right in their modeling. 
And the second worst one is that they don't get the, uh, the low solar glass component correct. And so they're putting in all these heavy gains on, on solar gain that are just blowing the system up and making it twice as big as it needs to be. Right. So we're going to cover that off next week, um, but we, we will get to that and, and cover it in detail. Right? Great. So I consider it to be a home team approach that we have to do to, to limit costly errors. You keep people in the dark and you make them into mushrooms. That's not good. <laughs> and, and I think you've heard me, uh, you've heard me say this more than once now, right? But you know, the number one thing that happens on a job site, right? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Yeah. Not a... So well, we, uh, we, I was, we want... I was really intrigued when you gave that example last week, Doug, you talked about, I mean, 39 hours to build that house, yeah. right? But then you, hired, you didn't hire a project manager per se. You hired somebody with pretty deep like project supply chain planning expertise. I actually put a young lady in charge of the schedule that had never done a schedule before. And she was able to do it because she didn't know it didn't work. Okay. If okay. I'd, great. If I'd had my construction team do it, they would have told me the thousand reasons why it didn't work. But right. we actually got it to work because she didn't know it couldn't happen. So she had an open mind talking to all the trades and, and everybody that were involved with it. And by the last meeting, the week before we were going to build, the framers just sat down with me and said, we've got this. This is going to work. It's going to be awesome. And, mm -hmm. and we just kicked the crap out of it. But we also had a former military guy that was in charge of staging. Okay. And he actually had um, the trucks. They were what we call parading, right? Yeah. So he had trucks all paraded and he was just able to call the truck as it was needed. Now, right. next year, because if, if you're going to do something stupid, you should film it. That's a, that's a really <laughs> big role. But next year, what we're doing is we're going to have a race between us and other builders. And we're going to try and build 12 tiny homes in a weekend. Wow. That's going to be nuts. But I'll, I'll talk about that uh, in session four. So yeah, lots to look forward to. Um, but what I, what I really like to talk about is, and, and you know, COVID has really kicked the heck out of this. So we're, we're looking at vertical integration to try and make some of this up. We're looking at uh, panelized framing for a lot of our product, but really trying to cut down on um, the, the sitting there with nothing happening. And so scheduling is important, but one of the things that hurts the schedule is when your site foreman doesn't have the answer he needs and he's got to find it and the trades are sitting there waiting for him. So that's why I think the home design review is really critically important to make sure that the site supers are engaged and understand what the outcome is you're trying to achieve. So that, that's why I say like getting, getting them involved in the, the host design review is kind of important. The next thing is, the, you know, in the house design review, I like to look at uh, what's called the not so big house. Uh, so this is the case for smaller design. And, you know, so many times I see builders, especially now when things are so expensive, um, do we really need to build McMansions or can we do really good design in a smaller, tighter footprint, right? Mm -hmm. So part of this is about addressing housing affordability. Can we make it work with less space? Uh, it's also about reducing carbon footprint. If the house is half the size, guess what? You're using half the materials, right? Uh, this is also about increasing community density without it feeling like you're back on top of each other completely, right? You can right. have these smaller homes, there, therefore the lot still remains a decent size. And um, this isn't just about towns and mid-rise, right? Which we are, we are doing mid-rise now and, and we'll be doing towns uh, right shortly. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also looking at tiny homes. And as I said, the not so big house, it's a really cool architecture. Okay. Doug, are you going to talk about that sweet spot of, you know, is it, 2,200 square feet? Is it 50 square, uh, fifty foot wide lots? Is it a third of an acre? Uh, are you going to detail some of that kind yeah, of? Yeah, I can, to be I can definitely. Spot? Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. In fact, this home right here is a great example. This is the Waterford Cottage, and this home won everything in Canada in 2006. We built it in 2005, so it's a it's a provincial winner, a national winner, uh, you name it, right? There it, in it really kind of changed how homes were designed and built in Canada as far as architectural goes. And so we're going to tear this home apart a little okay. bit, but it's actually 1500 square feet, this one. Wow. So it, it looks massive. It looks but huge. It, I, thought, I thought it was actually the McMansion, Doug. It's not. <laughs> okay. It, it, it's, it's not. And that's my point about um, optical, optical illusion, optical design. Mm -hmm. And so I, I do get into that. You know, things that are really cool is, if you have, say, an eight-foot ceiling, it, it, it gets really tunnel visioned as you move forward with, with that eight-foot ceiling throughout the house. But if you have one space where you can vault part of the ceiling up so that your eye sees height at the end of it, 
-hmm. that makes a huge difference as far as flow. And actually, that's actually a Frank Lloyd Wright uh, principle mm -hmm. from 100 plus years ago in his house in Buffalo, where you would walk in and, and the foyer is really claustrophobic. And then as you get, if he lets you pass, if the homeowner lets you pass the foyer, it opens up and you feel this really a feeling of immenseness of space. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't because the other rooms were huge, but it's because he channeled you through a tighter space into a larger space. And so that's part of what we look at with our designs is how do we, um, how do we treat the eye, right, to, to make you feel a certain way within the home. So that's, uh, that is part of what we do cover, right? Great. So uh, I'll bet you've heard this one, they don't build them like they used to, right? Mm -hmm. uh, my dad built this type of home for you know, 30 plus years, right? It's a simple bungalow little design. This is right across the street from my office in St. Thomas, Ontario. You know, it's gable-ended roof, real simple. It's actually not bad for solar because you got the whole cell side you can pick up. Um, but let's face it, homes aren't built the same way as they used to be. Uh, but this is, you know, that rectangular box beauty, 412 pitch on the gable ends, and there's no garage. Um, really simple to build, really cheap to build, right? Very simple to frame. You know, uh, this might have been at that point now you're looking at a truss roof, but it would just been near the start of the truss roofs. And then we do silly things like, you know, the kitchen on the back of the house there, we would do a cantilever out. And then, you know, they would tell the customer, well, listen, you know, in order to keep your taps from freezing in the wintertime like this, you just need to run the water a little yeah. bit in the sink in the kitchen, right? So your taps don't freeze. Right. And that, and that was considered good design back then. That's right. So, boy, we've kind of improved upon that, right? Just a little. A little bit. Yeah. Uh, but you know, with right orientation, it's a pretty darn good house, great for solar, and um, and they they can last a fair amount of time if you get rid of that cantilever or fix it so it works right. But this guy here, uh, Waterford Cottage, 2005 National Sam winner. Sam is uh, like the national awards for Canada, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but today we've got better windows, air barriers, insulation, shingles, and a whole host of new products that didn't even exist 40 years ago. The downside of that is we also got way more chemicals than we used to have too. So we have to be careful about that. Uh, but overall details and materials are just simply better, right? We, we know how to build better. Uh, but I think we can still benefit from looking at history, right? Because we can't ignore history lessons. We can't, we can't say, okay, well, new is better because, you know, now we do origami roofs, right? That's not necessarily better, right? Simple isn't always a sign of inferiority. Complexity has its challenges, and we have to make sure that our people are connected to the work that's done on site, especially the designers. So one of the things that I, I like to talk about is, you know, when, when I was a kid, I used to play with my dad's little uh, template. You know, you could draw the toilets with it, that sort of thing. It was always fun to kind of come up with crazy designs because it didn't mean anything to me. I was just playing. But he was a mining engineer, my dad, and a civil engineer, and I remember he would be taking that old uh, blue uh, architect paper and he'd be tracing out you know changing a door swing on a house and so you know when you had to do it by hand you didn't really want to make a lot of changes right ironically now that we're talking about panelization you don't really want to make a lot of changes so circles coming back around again yeah, yeah. but you know there was also way less specialization you didn't have the computers you didn't have 50 plans like you know we had maybe four plans right i can remember when i started with our company we had about four plans. Now you're supposed to have 10 new ones every year, right? Which is just daunting to keep up with. So um, here's the issue. Uh, you know, I've said I've done complicated and I found out that it's complicated, right? Um, complicated is challenging. Simple isn't always a sign of inferiority. Um, can your trades actually produce this correctly in the field, right? Does the design reflect the overall elements of the design review list, right? And is the design beneficial? So if you're doing something, does it provide benefit, right? So my point being here is just because it can be designed in the computer doesn't mean it should ever hit the job site. That does not even begin to consider issues such as skilled trade shortages and the ability to produce the end product. I've been in so many homes where it's like, you know, the designer of this home probably never walked this house because you'll, you'll walk in and all of a sudden you're hitting a really tight corridor and you, you know you can't get the bed turned around the side, right? There's just not room. And it's, it's things like that that I get really careful of. Now, that doesn't mean we got to go back to building 412 pitch houses or we should design our homes without beauty and function in mind. I think it's far from that. Uh, but in general terms, when you're considering your design concepts, 
Can you answer one simple question with each design consideration? Am I making the homeowner's life easier or harder? And if the answer is harder, then you really need to reconsider the design. Why am I doing it then? Am I doing it because I want to show off? Uh, or am I doing it because I'm providing benefit to the consumer? And that really, to me, is a designing guiding principle is, are, are we improving the occupant's life by how we're designing, right? However, these homes can't start and end with energy efficiency. They have to be functional, easy to maintain, pleasant to live in, and emotionally appealing. So add design elements that will help you sell the home. Just don't let the designer architect design for the sake of showing off. And I have a bit of an issue with architects that do that. You know, like as Dr. Stever said, there's nothing wrong with a flat roof that a 112 pitch can't fix. But you look at a lot of modern design now and they're coming out with like, you know, um, little turrets on the top and, and flat roofs and, and like, okay, where'd your water management strategy go here, guys? And how are you collecting any sort of solar, right? So when you're looking at getting into net zero, roof becomes really critically important, not just for water strategy, but also for your solar strategy. And we're gonna dive into that today. So uh, here's a couple points about this house. The exposed side elevation, that's a spot where we should be getting a bunch of solar. Uh, it was designed because it was on a corner and it's actually backing onto a lake. That's actually Lake Margaret here in St. Thomas. It does reduce the solar area, but we did also look at south and west exposures. So we were able to, to look at the overall solar exposure, but that's back when we were doing um, solar for thermal, not for, for um, electric, right? So it's a bit different. So the side bump boats on here, they look like they're really extravagant, extravagant expensive bump boats, but it's actually just a veneer change that goes straight up into the gable. So that's actually one continuous roof plane. It looks more complex than it actually is. So that reduces the envelope complexity without sacrificing visual appeal. And I think that that's really important. The other is you've got this really big, lovely porch on the front. So it's great uh, water management and especially porch interface with the garage. I'm able to get the water down off the roof and across the garage in a, in a way. So we, we wanna be looking at things like that. Um, the other thing with this is uh, we wanted to make sure that we had something that was really visually appealing. It was something we were trying to reset the tone with. So there is a mix of elements of, uh, like I said, the, the, the stone veneer uh, and also the, the James Hardy board and batten siding. So uh, the board and batten would help. Nowadays, we'd consider that helping to reduce our carbon footprint. But it, it's been done really, Aaron, to optimize the visuals in a very tight space. Like I said, this home is 1,500, uh, 1,498 square feet was the actual number when we submitted it. Mm -hmm. Any basement in that one? Yes, there is. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you, and, and we find that we do a lot of basement, uh, basement homes and people are able to finish them because of the basement detailing we do, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in just a little bit today. So the not so big house, designers need to consider the client's needs. Flow and storage are really critical and sight lines must provide vistas. So that's what I was saying before you come in at the foyer you're looking through the kitchen area and then at the back, the great room starts to bump up so that it'll allow your eye to flow upwards. And that not only allows for some better windows on the back, but it also gives you the opportunity for your, your, your conscious to your subconsciousness to, to feel that you're into a larger space than it actually is. So it's just playing with space, right? So like I said, when you're designing smaller, you've really got to think of flow and you've got to look at the space within it. It's actually really easy to design a big space, but it's quite difficult to get all of that to work in a smaller home. Um, sometimes I often wonder if, if the designer was given poor instructions about what they were supposed to do, or maybe they just don't understand how space flows. Um, and again, so many times I think they've never been to a host that designed. That's why I always make sure our designers are taking regular trips out and I'll periodically go with them and say, you know, how do you feel about this? Do you think you could improve it? So we continually to not worry about just the first time we design the home, but as we continue to build the home, can we tweak it? Is there something that could work better? So we're constantly thinking about making it a little bit better. So here's an example. Uh, really common to see huge bedrooms and then uh, the hallways and doors to be to the code minimum. And it feels so claustrophobic getting into the bedroom. You, you don't feel it's welcoming going to, to the bedroom. And so we actually 
tend to make the beds bedrooms like more right sized. You know, you don't need the second bedroom to, to house a master bedroom if it's a three bedroom home for family, right? So the big one that fits the king size bed, you know, that's the, the principal bedroom, I guess they like to call it now. I still refer to it as the master bedroom. But I think that that's important. The other one is storage, man. You know, where are you putting your linens? Mm -hmm. So often it's an afterthought if it's considered at all. And, you know, you don't need to have super big linens, but you do need storage in the home. And that's something when you consider your buyer is typically a woman, um, they are much more organized than us guys, trust me. And they do consider that, where am I putting my stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And then God forbid, but they go shopping and buy more stuff and you have no space for it. So we, we do wanna make sure that we're considering that in our designs, right? So looking at the interior of this plan, you can see the roof line would be continuous along the kitchen dining area. And then it's got the roof line continued up over a covered deck area. So it simplifies the roof line, it does add cost, but now you're into potential three season space. You've got a really nice covered deck area. Um, and, and folks just absolutely love it. The home Doug, I'm in you, right now. Is, Doug, what are you doing for standard height in that regular height ceiling? This specific home is, is nine foot ceiling, uh, right. but we do have different homes that are in the same square footage that are eight, similar treatment with the vault at the back, that sort of thing. So we're either eight, eight or nine. got that vault side to side. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it makes a big, big difference, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, the nice thing about that as well, Aaron, is it helps to keep the truss design relatively uniform and simple, although you do have to deal with the gable at the back, right? right. Now, here's a mistake we made in this plan, although, um, you know, maybe it's not a mistake, but when you bump that gable out at the back, the great room out at the back to create that gable effect, you don't actually have to bump the roof line out and the back wall out. You can do that without just by changing your truss system. So we, we did do that, but keep in mind that adds four corners to the house that don't need to be there, right? So if I was to say revisit this home again and I'm looking at reducing cost a bit, I would probably make that great room just a tiny bit smaller and bump out the master bedroom. But to be honest with you, the category was 1500 square feet or less and we brought it in at 1498, right? Okay, so what you're saying is you would have just made the master and the great room back wall linear all the way across. Yeah, if you wanna save money, do that for right. sure and just, yeah fake the gable up into the roof and it'll work quite yeah. well. Um, <clears throat> so the next thing above, and, and I'd also did not want to do a cantilever on this. So we do have the, uh, the, the four corners are actually going right down through the foundation as well, right? I'm not really a fan on cantilevers. They cause a ton of grief. Pretty much if you're throwing cantilevers on a house, you should probably engineer it out of the house because you're going to cause yourself problems. I get there's a lot of time you have to do it, but be really careful about your detailing on those. They're a, they're a huge way to cause problems in a home. I just ripped apart a house really similar to this uh, 1970s house that I showed you, and th that back kitchen wall was a total mess, and it was because of the cantilever, right? Uh, another point I wanted to mention, if we can just kind of look at the bathrooms for a second, you'll see that the tub shower in the bathroom and the ensuite, they're, they're basically stacked side by each, and mm -hmm. that's going to allow us to reduce our plumbing and specifically as well, because of this situation, we're talking about a home that's going to have a drain water heat recovery pipe. Do you guys use the drain water pipe in the States? Yeah, I think some people do, some people don't. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we, in our system, we, we have to include it for, uh, well, I can get around it in code, but for, for net zero, it's just easier if I put it in. Um, I'm of two minds on, on the drain water pipe, because if I'm selling to a little old lady that takes two baths a week, it doesn't help her at all family of four that take long showers every day, it's a great add on, right? But it, to me, there's other things that money should be spent on before drain water pipe, but in our case, we do have to deal with it. So this one's designed for that. So you're reducing your plumbing costs by having the two showers stacked one beside each other, and we're able to get a common shower drain, uh, which is actually into the multiple common, common plumbing drain that the drain water um, is going down. Helps to reduce costs, makes the plumbing simpler. And the other thing is, is if by chance you've got a, a master ensuite going to the very back of the home, please be kind and dig out the underground pipe for the plumber so he's not having to dig it out. Because if you're in something like clay and then you put the gravel in and then you put the plumber in there and he's got to do that in July, he's going to hate you. Right. Hate you, right? right? But you know, your excavator can do it in about 30 minutes with his bucket. Yeah, so what you're doing is you're just putting a nice trench into him for the main line. See, it's important. Yeah. It's called being nice. Right? Yes, absolutely. I don't know. I like to be nice to my trades. Sometimes they're hard yeah. to find. Uh, here's another one. Ditch the lazy Susan. Oh my God. I'm so, 
I hate those you know, <laughs> kitchen corners. Oh, we've got these lovely cabinets. That's just a place to lose all your lids, right? <laughs> so what we do is we put in walk-in pantries, even in homes that are only you know 1,300 square feet. Right. Why? Because people like them. Yeah. Remember who's the buyer, right? It, the woman is buying this home. She's going to live in it. She's making that primary decision. The husband might think he is, but it's not really true, right? So she's going to look at that kitchen and be happy because she's like, I can put this here. I can put that there. You know, I got my bread making machine. I got my pot, you know, all of the above. And I can, it, it stores in there really nice, right? And the kids can go in, they can get their snacks down low. It's easy. So for relatively the same cost nowadays with cabinets costing so much, it might even be cheaper, but ditch the lazy Susan, put in a walk-in pantry. Uh, same goes for rethinking the linen closets. You know, they don't have to be too big and they don't have to be deep. But in my mind, a deep linen is actually a waste of space and money because, you know, if you've got small stuff in a deep linen, you can't get to it. It gets lost, right? So when I look at like the largest set of towels you've got and they're full, they're, they're roughly 14 square for a beach towel. The luxury towels are more like 17 by 12. You can get them to fold. So you only need about two more inches more than that. We typically therefore design our depth at around 18 inches depth. That's what I prefer. 20 is kind of a max. You go up to 24 inches and you're now starting to waste space in the linen, right? You just, you can't get far enough back to get to it. The other thing is, is hallways are too small, right? So I prefer, even in these small, not so big homes, hallways to be at least 46 to 48 inches wide. We do that, and then you know it's easy to get a 30-inch door in there, but you can even better, I, I do pretty much typically on a bedroom 32, but you've also got space now to get up to a 36, right, if you've got to get there. So yeah. if you're looking at mobility issues, it's really easy to convert over. So that, that to me is really important. Like I said, don't make the hallways too small. It's better to actually sacrifice a little bit of space in the bedroom and make it so it's more inviting to get there, right? The other one is pre-design your mechanical room location. And if you can, condense the size. The worst thing is, is you let the HVAC contractor do it and all of a sudden you've got a furnace right in where the future rec room is gonna be. That will upset your client like nobody's business because when they go to finish, they're like, uh, this doesn't work, right? So we do pre-design it. And in fact, when we're doing our HVAC designs, we pre-design it as if those rooms are all in existence and design our energy loads or heat, heat, heating and cooling loads based on pre-existing rooms down there. So we pre-design basements, right? Um, but yeah, don't let the HVAC contractor control the location, right? Another one is, you know what I call a cold cellar? A mold factory attached to your home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you really want to have that extra space, then condition it, design it to be conditioned, right? The problem is, is that the cold cellar is designed to get hot or warm, if you will, and cold, depending on the time of year and how hot or how cold it gets. So it's going to fluctuate in temperature and it's going to fluctuate in moisture levels, okay? And so it's really difficult to keep clean because you do have to have vents on it and that will induce dust in there. And you know what mold needs to grow? It needs moisture, it needs warmth, and it needs dust, okay? So summertime, you're going to get mold growth, right? Uh, but people will put stuff in there that shouldn't be there, like clothing or, you know, their wine in their um, cardboard boxes still, or they'll store, I've seen all kinds of crazy stuff. So nobody really seems to know how to use these anymore. I mean, I remember my dad, he'd get the, the prosciutto ham from the local Italian uh, friends of his, and it'd be hanging down there and it would have like a half an inch of mold growing on it. And then you'd, you'd cut the mold off, right? And then you'd have the prosciutto left over and you'd, you'd cut that and you'd eat that, right? Uh, people go crazy if you did that nowadays, right? <laughs> can't you can't do that anymore? Yeah. Um, so house design action plan. So what I said before is stack the bathrooms or design a common wet wall. Be wary of main floor bathrooms at the back of the home. Think about window placement and size. That's actually also an important point as well. We want to make sure that we've got good size windows in the right rooms. Um, I always say change at least one of the basement windows to an egress window. And then the next one is walls. Like who needs walls, man? Well, well, we do, uh, especially I do because we do some difference with our mechanicals where we do interior wall high throw. So I, I don't do any mechanicals coming up from the floor. And I don't, I don't do that crazy thing where you put your mechanicals in the attic. I, I don't understand the concept of that. Um, to me, that's just, you know, waiting for a total disaster to, to befall upon you. Mm -hmm. um, but for those that do it, well, we'll cover a bit of that off later. 
for the exterior, limit the inclusions of bump outs and cantilevers, and then look at things like advanced framing, total value engineering, and, and waste reduction. And so total value engineering is it's a whole specific concept on, on measurements and optimizing your framing package to improve your efficiencies. Um, the one thing I would come back to on the lighting is you know, natural lighting is really important. So for example, if you've got a two story and you got a stairwell going up to a second floor that's kind of closed in within the space, adding a window in that can make that space feel really warm and inviting light uh, and, and, and much less claustrophobic, right? So we, we want to basically try and keep it simple, but let the light in. Um, the other thing is, is we've been able to, to, with our mechanical systems, we've been able to get around some of our issues by decorative drywall columns, uh, by putting specific finishing off walls at the end of uh, your kitchen cabinetry, which actually cuts down on the gable end cost anyway. So it does offset a little bit of the cost as well. Uh, but there's different things that we can do that we can help to make sure the home still has flow, but also can look at, you know, how to manage the HVAC system and provide comfort with the occupant as well. Because remember from session one, we always are wanting to look at occupant comfort as part of this as well, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess the, the first uh, next question up to bat is what size of homes are being most requested by clients? And I got a follow-up comment after we've done this survey, but the first is zero to 1250. The second one is 1250 to 15, and then 15 to two and 2000 to three. So while you're filling out that survey, my comment on that is, is that because people don't understand space and they think that they need more space than they actually do. And part of that is because the designs to get the things that they want into the space typically only happen in bigger designs because we're not optimizing our smaller design space. And so oftentimes I find that people think that they need an 1800 square foot uh, bungalow when in actual fact, the 1400 square foot one will work quite well for them. Right? Hmm. And is that, is that a function of them being in the model and see, seeing and feeling that space that they go, Oh no, 1400 is fine. So here's really cool, right? 2,000 to 3,000 yeah. was the largest number. Yeah. I virtually never build a home as big as 3,000 square feet. Wow. Almost never do it, right? Hmm. Um, I've got a couple of designs that are over 3,000 square feet. Anything I've done above that, it's been custom homes. We don't do very many of those. We might do you know, one every, every year or so. Um, what we do is we really try and look at optimizing space. So you can easily, if you do the design right, back off maybe 400 square feet to 800 square feet and what people are thinking. If you can provide them with what they want in a smaller space, and that's really about the not so big house and really optimizing your plans, right? Mm. So you know when you're looking at what, 300 bucks a square foot and you knock out 400 square feet, I can't do that math real quick, but it's a lot of money, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, worth, uh, it's worth looking at. The other one is, I think we do have another question here, stacked back to back here. So um, of your portfolio, what percentage are singles, towns, mid-rise or other? So uh, I think this might be an opportunity to pick different ones, but uh, are, are people looking at building singles? Are they doing towns? Are you getting into mid-rise? We're gonna talk about mid-rise a little bit on session four mm -hmm. and then other, other would be something like tiny homes or something really specific, right? So what uh, what's populating this here list? Uh, so far, a hundred percent singles. Really? Wow. Okay. Okay. Now we got somebody uh, does singles and towns. Excellent. And we just got a other. So again, if you can, um, we'd love to hear in the chat section on your other if you're doing ADUs or tiny homes or, you know, what you might be doing. That's uh, that's great. Yeah, we're, we're seeing such a, a rapid rise in cost that we're, we're really having to start to advance into other uh, built forms. Mm -hmm. And there's some certain specific techniques that are really required in order to do that well and be successful in it. And we're going to cover that off today. So as people start to look at maybe having to get into semis and towns or even mid-rise, there's some things that we need to look at. And I'll talk mm -hmm. about that today as well. Great. Okay, so keeping going here, we're going to get into energy modeling here now. So the first thing I'd say is why bother with energy modeling, right? Uh, I can just go prescriptive, right? So if I follow, and I'm not exactly sure how your guys' codes work, but typically what we've got is you can go performance or you can go prescriptive. Mm 
-hmm. And prescriptive is kind of like following a pre-existing recipe and thou shalt follow the recipe. It's really in my mind, designing for dummies, right? Um, there's, you're leaving so much on the table um, that you, you might want to really consider, right? So while they're what's called the mandatory minimum pass, uh, it's a great starting point for your team to at least start looking at benchmarking, that sort of thing, because you don't have to put a lot of thought into it and you can really crank it out rather quickly. But as the codes uh, become more targeted and it gets more costly and you're competing against guys that don't know better, there's opportunity here, I'm telling you, that you can really optimize your designs, save money, and start to get that, well, you know, your net zero home is 40 grand more than the code thing down under a lot better control by mm -hmm. just better design and, and techniques on how you're doing it. So part of that is, is looking at the code portion of it and how can we improve on the energy modeling. And I find that performance is really the best way to go. Um, you need a good e energy uh, advisor or energy rater working with you on that. Um, yeah, and Doug, can, can we just reiterate that? Because I don't know that I've met any builder in North America that is going after net zero that doesn't have an energy advisor on, on the team. It's first out of the gate, man. Right. Really. Yeah. It, it, you just, you have to do it. And, and that's why I said in the first session, the first thing you want to do is build your team. And the first guy on your team, the first person you're adding is going to be a really good quality energy advisor, right? You just yeah. have to have that person. No, that doesn't mean they're in-house. Um, and even though I'm actually adding an energy advisor to my team in a couple of weeks, that's not changing the dynamic of our work with our, our we work with building knowledge with George Cook, Brad yeah. Cook's company. Yeah. Um, that, that relationship is going to remain. But what we're finding is, is we're getting into so much work as far as trying new products and bringing things to market and what have you, because we have a fairly significant R and D budget that we run every year into our homes that we just, you know, with the size we're at now, we need somebody to run that so that we're not constantly putting pressure on the, the energy advisor. We're taking that portion of it in-house, but you just you just can't typically as a builder starting out that doesn't know what you know. Like I'm blessed, I've had a lot of years doing this. We've got an idea of where we need to go. Uh, for example, there's a company here in the States called RIA that's doing some really cool work on, on HVAC, right? Mm -hmm. um, very similar to what we're doing with Detson. That's a company that, you know, folks in the States maybe wanted to look at. Well, if you've never done that type of work before, who's going to guide you to those decisions? Right. And that's where having your, your energy advisor is really critically important. Yeah. Uh, and, just a, and just a commercial for EBA, if you're looking for an energy rater, energy advisor out there, we have a directory of net zero energy professionals up at EBA.org. You can go in, you can find your energy rater in your local market. You can go to the ResNet site or other and check that they're currently certified. And it's a great place to find people with this type of experience. Yeah. And I, I would absolutely turn people into exactly that. Go to Eva and find somebody and then cross-reference it. And if you need to, if you know a builder in your area that's friendly with you, that's maybe using that person, see if you can get them to talk to you about know, what their experience is, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I know when we first started out, the, the first guy we had, it, he just wasn't able to keep up with, with where we were going. And you know, I, I finally, you know, I knew Gord from doing presentations, but I finally ended up with his company after about a year because I was so frustrated. And, uh, and you know, and we've pushed them hard over the years. We, we do a lot of stuff. So it's been, it's been a great relationship, but that's what you need is it, it needs to be a partnership, right? It needs to be a partnership. It doesn't work. So I'm talking a lot here and I'm going to try and put the oh. gas on the pedal on the gas a little bit, I think. Okay. Um, anyway, so what's the benefit? Being able to be, begin the process with a plan really is what I'm talking about. You know, it's kind, time consuming and difficult to take the first steps without an energy modeling uh, in place and an energy advisor. And there's lots of potential options you've got to consider. So it makes it much easier. It's also critical that you're a look at this holistically with the house as a system whole home approach. You do not want to have somebody that's rigid in their thinking. I will only advise you this way because there's different things you should really be considering based on what you're trying to do. Um, but also in speaking with an industry leader building from the United States, he actually lamented that he'd asked his team to model the most effective wall that his trades would be able to build when afterwards he realized he should have asked him to model the most effective wall system. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between a wall and a wall system, and we're going to get into that in a little bit. What's the difference? Well, he ended up with an R44 double wall. His guys could frame it and they could insulate it, but he had really crummy windows, right? 
So he lost almost all the benefit of that thicker wall because of bad windows. He had tremendous heat loss in the winter time, and then he had just huge solar gains because of the sunlight coming in, especially west facing. Uh, and that forced him to oversize the HVAC system. And what we really learn as we get into more detail in HVAC design for, for net zero is you've got to control your uncontrolled heat gains, right? I know it sounds simple, but it's critically important. Yeah. So in this particular case, if this, uh, this builder's team had been asked to design the best wall system, he had to put less money into his wall and more into the windows. And that's what I advocate. We want to have better balance overall. His energy performance would have been greatly improved. The HVAC system would have been right sized and the occupant would have had not to put blinds on the really nice view to the backyard that they now lost the view of the backyard because otherwise they couldn't sit in the room. I've been there. I've done that. I know the experience. Mm -hmm. So energy modeling is really important. And then following through on what you're picking is also critical. So um, my experience is it won't be perfect the first time. For example, working in the team at Building Knowledge, it took us several iterations over a number of years to get the most cost-effective wall system that our collective trade and staff team could build. Part of this was stepping up to a higher energy requirements and part was getting the collective knowledge to build the systems effectively, the wall systems I'm talking about. So when we first went to net zero, uh, our, all, our walls were, our system was a two by six wall with two inches of rigid foam on the outside. Um, the framing wasn't really that much more difficult than doing say an R5 or one inch of rigid insulation. The problem is, is that when you go that up extra inch of insulation, because we typically have brick on our homes here, our foundation wall went from a nine inch to a 10 inch foundation wall, right? Yeah. So now you've, you've increased your, your total carbon footprint of your foundation, which is the most worst part of carbon in the house yeah. by another you know 12 plus percent right mm. um reviewing this uh, with building knowledge we were able to get it down to an inch and a half of rigid insulation on the wall and uh that was well more than two thousand dollars in savings at that time it got us back to the in the uh, nine inch foundation wall which was really critical to us because it was just a lot easier uh, to build and less cost so quickly looking at this, this is something that some energy advisors provide. They should all be able to get you in sort of the ballpark where you're looking at a baseline versus code, uh, what your incremental cost is going to be. Hopefully, they'll be able to give you a rough idea on that, although your, your evaluators, your, your uh, folks doing your costing should be able to look at that in more detail. And then what um, a modified version moving to a more advanced uh, code or net zero would look like. So it's pretty easy to, to dive into these numbers. For example, adding the uh, adding the incremental cost on the solar for that one house was around thirty eight thousand. What this energy advisor was advising, we've got our number down quite a bit less. This was a fairly big one that this energy advisor was looking at. And Doug, that's in that's in Canadian dollars too, right? Yeah. So it's hardly anything for you guys, but for that's us, that's, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we're we're down now typically around maybe twenty four to twenty six thousand. So this this was actually quite a big house that he looked at. Yeah. Um, the table also should start looking at what's called a, a gigajoule. Do you guys use gigajoules down there? Sure. I think that's universal. Beautiful. That makes it a lot easier to talk about. So it should indicate the gigajoules and the potential gigajoule savings for the items that's being considered. So you're able to cross-reference and say, okay, well, if I put this in, it costs this much, but I'm saving this many gigajoules. Because if you're fully going for net zero, you're looking at as few a number of gigajoules as possible because you've only got so much roof, right? Mm -hmm. So it's important that we start to get our gigajoule number down so we've got space on the roof to cover it off. Um, in this case, if all the items shown were used, it reduces the consumption, consumption sorry, by about 49 gigajoules or about 41% for an additional cost of around 11,500 bucks. So that to me is actually a fairly reasonable trade because, um, that amount of gigajoule reduction, like I said, this is a really fairly big house. Um, that that's a good trade. I would take that any day because the solar is going to cost you that much or more, right? And on your attic, Doug, you were looking at was it R fifty one versus R seventy? Is that what was that the trade off? Um, in this particular case, yeah, it, I believe it was. Um, we've landed uh, our sweet spot is actually at R sixty in the attic. Uh, okay, the slightly raised hill height. Um, you, you're starting to get into diminishing returns on um, additional insulation in the attic when you go above R60. 
And quite honestly, Aaron, I think it's better off that you put more focus on getting your air tightness down. Under one air change is a big deal. Yeah. Keep going here. Next is what's your air tightness plan? Because you need one, right? So this is where your energy advisor's got to be able to help you with this, right? It's just critically important that, that they're able to help you. So our desired outcome in this is in order to reduce your energy consumption enough to build the net zero, you need to consistently build every home under one air change, right? That is significantly less than a cold build home and still less than the 2.5 that we need in Ontario for Energy Star program. Um, what's the benefit? So air leakage is where the largest energy loss occurs. So it makes sense to address this first, but there are numerous additional cold benefits when you get your air leakage under control. You can downsize your HVAC system for heating and cooling, um, you can also look at, you've got better indoor air quality uh, and just a whole host of other things, inclusive of making a more durable wall, right? Because if air leakage is allowing air to get into the wall, you've got the potential for wall rot, right? So we, we really want to manage that. So air leakage also results in a more comfortable home and greater ability to maintain consistent indoor air temperatures all, door, all, all year long. You get rid of the cold spots where you got a draft and it's not comfortable to be around by, by simply doing that. That, and of course, you've got to adjust your windows. But let's face it, builders often um, really struggle when they're doing semis and towns and what have you. I, I know there's an awful lot of builders in, in our province in Ontario they, they can't get under five air changes per hour if they're building a semi. And most of the leakage is actually happening between units. And I remember this story um, from years ago where I was talking to the building official and they weren't allowing me to do this detail that I'm about to show you that we created um, working with building knowledge and also with, with uh, Rockwool. Uh, we came up with the detail and, and we had to actually end up having an engineer for them to accept it. But I talked to the building inspector who's, who's a buddy of mine. And I said, what's the problem? He says, well, you know, you don't have a continuous fire stop. And it says, yes, I do. I have a continuous fire stop system. So you're thinking I have to use drywall. I don't. I can actually use a wood assembly to make the same thing happen. And he was talking about at the interface between the garage and the house at the party wall, right? And so I said, well, what's the big deal? I just want to be able to put an air barrier across my, my party wall. And he says, but Doug, the code doesn't need an air barrier for, for on the party wall, on, the, on your interior wall. And I said, and his name is Jamie Okowski. I said, oh, Jamie, you guys are worried about, about the fire. I'm worried about smoke because the smoke's going to kill you before the fire ever gets there. So why don't you let me do what I'm doing? I'll make sure that you're, you're righteous on your detail, but this works way better, right? And so he did. And then it's funny because um, it was maybe about a half year, nine months later, something like that. The building officials magazine came out and they had my wall featured in it as this is the way you should build this type of wall, right? So, you know, that whole concept about, uh, and, and I often say it's about, can you smell your neighbor's cooking? Cause if you can, you're in trouble, right? Yeah, right? I mean, it doesn't matter. It might smell really good, but if you can smell it, you got a problem. Right. Also cuts down on flanking noise, but you remember that detail that all builders, a lot of them still do is they get the brick layer to come back and they build that cinder block wall right up in between the two units. That's like effectively putting a sieve in your building for air, hmm. right? And that's why these builders can't get the number down because they're using that as their, their fire stop detail, but it doesn't work, right? Whereas this detail here, and folks are gonna get the slide decks, right? So we'll share this detail around. The one on the left is from Building Knowledge. It's virtually identical to the one from Rockwell. Uh, so you, you've got opportunity to work with energy advisors that have these details. I believe construction instruction uh, that Gord's involved with will also have this detail, but I highly, highly recommend it. It works fantastic, right? Um, but why we want this is because we want to be able to do our fire stop for sure, but then we want to be able to stop sound, noise, smell, everything from transferring between the, the two units, right? And it's actually, once you understand it, it improves your sequencing, Aaron. So why wouldn't you do it? You don't have to wait for the brookie to come back. Your framers do this. Right. Right. Same thing can be done in apartment units, by the way. So anyway, there's a couple of detailing here. This is a detail where you have a perpendicular wall that connects to the priority wall. So you've got a detail to make sure that your, your continuous uh, air barrier system is in place. And that it's important to note that we do need to connect the air barriers. So whether you use acoustical sealant or other measures like tape to, to pull it together, it's important to get that. You can relatively achieve it through um, overlapping as well, but I find it's better to put a little bit of acoustical sealant in there until we came up with a new thing.
Here's another detail. I'm not going to really get into it, but that's basically the same idea when you're on the back wall of a house to, to make sure that you've got it. So that's your, your interface of your party wall at the back wall, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, trouble tightening, the air tightness challenge getting under 1.5. Well, it actually should be under one, right? Right. A lot of times there's difficulty with trade consist consistency. It can be some challenging details. And how do you fix it? Well, sometimes it's just hard depending on what your trade base is, right? So then you got aero barrier, right? Mm -hmm. So we've done a lot of work with these guys. I love the fact that you get a really nice report from them. Uh, you know, it's changing the way houses are built. This is definitely a disruptive technology that players right. need to have on their radar, right? So, uh, you know, Gord's uh, been really heavily involved with it, but we've done a lot of testing with, with building knowledge with Aero Barrier in, in Ontario here, advancing the program. And yeah, this just, is a, just a commercial here. Aero Barrier just received 22 million US from uh, Bill Gates' investment arm because he believes this is one of the biggest carbon reduction strategies that can happen uh, in it's, the world. It's really cool. It's, it's really awesome. cool. Yeah. So, I'm not going to get into it too much today, but when we get into apartments and building uh, day four, mm -hmm. we will cover it off a bit. The compartmentalization aspect of it is really what I'm looking at here. So this is called the case for compartmentalization. And if you can't get it by traditional means, and especially in apartment buildings, it's actually quite hard. Uh, the arrow barrier is something that you can come in and a couple hours later, they're done, right? right. So if you're struggling with getting your air tightness details down, you know, maybe 3000 bucks. So in the States, that's what, maybe about $2,000, $2,200, you're done. Okay. It, it's that big of a game changer. So we're looking at this one home here. We got it down to 0.22 air changes. This is on a semi that most builders in our market can't get under five. Yeah. It's that big of a deal. That's and incredible. we started at 1.32. So we were a little bit higher than we wanted to be on this unit. And we were able to get it down to 0.22, right? Nice. And just for those of you watching, um, you can go to EBA Academy. There are sessions on Aero Barrier, how to deploy it across um, the properties that you're building. Please take a look. For certain, it's uh, I, I just highly recommend it. And it was uh, less than three hours they did, right? So here's- uh, You do that before sheetrock, of course, right? You're, you're doing that before you close up the wall, you're getting it all. Well, no, we uh, we've we've experimented. We've actually done it uh, before we put insulation into the into the stud cavity as well. But okay. the, I found that the sweet spot for for me, okay, is that you actually do it sheet rocks on before you mud. Mm -hmm. You're going to use a little bit more, but keep in mind, typically your sheet rock crew is different from your mud crew. Mm -hmm. And if you do it after first mud, then your mud crew's got to stop and they're waiting for you, and that's not going to gain your friends. So what we found was best is you do sheet rock, then, then arrow barrier, then mud, okay? And that works, I think, pretty well. But it, it's, uh, you know, you got to try it. You got to get used to it and, and see what works for you. But you won't go wrong with using that as your methodology. So that's all I'm saying, right? Mm -hmm. So um, what air tightness are we hitting, kids? <laughs> are you under one and a half? Uh, are you three and a half plus? Do you know? If you're no, then maybe put uh, no air testing if you don't know, right? But curious to see, and actually it should be under, that should have been under one air change. So if, if we, uh, hopefully we're seeing a whole lot of people under one and a half, because um, if not, then, then you need to work with your energy advisor on your details. And there's certain details that I'm gonna cover off right shortly here on water that are in my mind, non-negotiable as well that need to be dealt with that actually help with the overall wall system air tightness. What are, what are we getting, Aaron? Uh, looks like a lot of people under 3.5, but the majority uh, under 1.5 detached and less than 1.5 on attached. Yeah. So that seems to be, no one clicked 3.5 plus. So that's good. Yeah. Well, no, we got one yeah. on. No, actually, you got you got one. I know, yeah, we got one 3.5 on detached. Yeah. Okay. So it's a range, right? Yeah. Like I'm saying, if you want to make it simple, then it's talk to the air bearer, arrow barrier guys and, and get there. Okay. So now full disclosure, um, we have started our own HVAC company. It's called Abode Home Comfort, and uh, we're just getting that up and operational. But we're, we're taking the territory of uh, London St. Thomas uh, uh, market 
uh, with the arrow barrier later this fall um, because we just believe in the system so much and with the amount of apartment units we've got coming up, it just makes sense for us to bring that in-house. Nice. Okay, I'm gonna uh, move forward here. Oh, can we close it? Okay, we can. So the optimal wall, we should probably talk about what a wall should look like, I guess. Um, choosing the optimal wall, uh, it might take you a few tries. Don't expect to get it perfect. Um, be careful in, in your market. If you do need two inches of rigid insulation and you're using brick, you're gonna be probably into a larger foundation unless you go to an ICF foundation that accounts for that or um, you, know, you go to a thinner brick veneer, right? Alternatively, will your market accept siding, okay? But remember, continuous insulation is really critically important. It's not just about reducing thermal bridges. It's, uh, it, it's just gotta be part of your whole wall package, right? It does come with a concern about you put a lot of insulation on the outside. Uh, water management and air sealing becomes critically important. Um, and and it just, it's a multiplier effect as soon as you go to a rigid continuous insulation that's basically acting as a vapor barrier. And the concern is, is that if you put uh, a vapor barrier on the outside, and then here in Canada, we got to do a vapor barrier on the inside, unless we can prove to them we don't, you get basically the poop sandwich if you get water in there, right? So we're doing a lot of work now with, with aero barrier being our air barrier on the inside, and we're eliminating the poly on the interior wall, uh, interior side of the wall, because we've got an inch and a half of foam. And in our climate, uh, that deals with our dew point issue, right? So... In my mind, building a very tight home is not just about reducing energy consumption. It's also about building a more durable, longer lasting home. You know, if we're talking about reducing our carbon footprint, we end up after 15 years ripping the house apart and it's half of it's going to the landfill. We didn't do our job, right? So durability is really critical to success. And that means you got to chain your site supers, your back framers, and any trade that cuts a hole in that wall has got to deal with it. Um, they just need to own the hole, right? So. Um, I don't know, you guys use nominal versus effective R value. Nominal is what's printed on the bag of insulation. Effective is actually looking at the wall assembly, right? Right. So I'm a, I'm a bit of a geek. There is a big difference between the two, by the way. So this is actually my calculator that I created, right? One day I just kind of got bored. I was like, I probably need to understand this better. I was doing some code work at the time. Um, so in this particular case, we're just looking at the ISO portion of, so poly ISO, uh, sand, right? I don't use in my climate, uh, it's actually a Southern States insulation. It shouldn't be used in a cold climate because it's insulation value reduces in colder weather. But if I've already got an inch and a half of insulation on my wall and I've got to put a cold air return in an exterior wall, adding two inches of poly ISO in behind there is, uh, is, is not a terrible idea because you've already got the insulation on the outside to keep it from getting cold so it doesn't diminish its insulated value that way, okay? So effectively what we're looking at here is what is the total R value capacity within this wall assembly, right? What's the effect of R value? So you're looking at your gypsum board, you're looking at your studs, and you're looking at your insulation, you're looking at your, um, all of this put together. And then we ended up uh, that, that wall assembly, which was um, basically it's an R13 plus an R5, R18 in the cavity itself. You're actually down to about 17.54, just looking at that cavity assembly, okay? So we, we've done that for a whole bunch of different things. And I'm, I'm gonna tell you that there's a lot better nowadays, but, um, this was before I really got geeked out on it, but then I started uh, looking at, well, how does this affect me if I'm looking at the window to wall ratio? So we're gonna put some windows in here now, right? And so Ontario Building Code, that's OBC. So this is uh, windows that are four foot by three. So you're looking at 24 square foot total versus a wall that's 200 square feet. Uh, so it's 100, 176 foot of a wall versus 24 square foot of uh, window area. So it's uh, 12 to 88 is your ratio, right? Your effective R value is 2.86 on the window and 18.34 on the wall. You're at 11.2. So that window, those two windows, dropped your wall effective ratio by that much. And that's why I'm saying it's a big deal to look at windows. If you come all the way down to the bottom here, we did improve our, uh, our R value a little bit by going to a higher insulated wall. And we improved our windows a whole lot by going to triple glazed uh, 
Energy Star rated windows, and we were able to increase that assembly by by a fair bit, right? So that's what we look at when we're really trying to dive into it. Now, most people aren't as stupid as me, Aaron, so they're not going to take the time to create a calculator. What you can do is go to uh, effectiveer.ca, uh, uh, and this is from uh, the, Wood, the Wood Council, Canadian Wood Council, and it's a free app, right? It's really cool, and you can blast through a whole bunch of different wall assemblies, that sort of thing. Now, I'm, I'm not sure. I can't remember if they actually will calculate the R value of the, uh, of the wall ratio as well to windows. That might be something you've got to get your EA into doing with you. Um, but I, I'm a bit of a geek that way. So I wanted to understand the impact. And so when a builder is talking to me about, well, you know, I'm, I'm using these cheap windows, but I'm doing a really awesome wall. That's where I say you might want to rethink that because it has a really negative impact on your assembly if you do that. Uh, this one here, though, it's got over 16,000 wall configurations in it, and they're constantly adding, updating it. Um, the other thing as well on this is it does start to think about things like smart vapor retarders. So it's going to show you the wall assembly. It's going to show you how to build the wall. Uh, really some nice detailing on this, right? And then it's going to have down at the bottom um, things like in your area, you can see where your geographic area is whether it's actually gonna function for that area, right? So I, I like that, right? So um, the left image here is showing one of the highest air value wall options available. That's that double stud wall with R51 blown insulation in. It's resulting around uh, R43, right? Um, but again, if you put really crappy windows in there and a fair bit of them, then that isn't gonna help you a lot. Uh, but there's this, like I said, there's this durability analysis at the bottom left side wall has permeable insulation, therefore it doesn't include the inboard outboard ratio in it. So it's got good dryability to it. The one on the, on the right though, it's got some rigid insulation going on. And so we have to be a little bit careful that it does in certain climate conditions, it might have uh, not the right amount of permeability you're looking for. So you may have to beef up your exterior insulation and in your climate zone, depending on what you're looking at. Um, so yeah, this is a Canadian one. I'm not sure if there's an American equivalent, but, uh, they've got, you know, different zones that you can pick from to see about the durability analysis. So, uh, this is a really great case for looking at what we call a smart vapor retarder. I use it a ton in my basements, sometimes on above grade walls, but, uh, the smart vapor retarder effectively, what it's going to do is in, in the winter time, it's going to close up like a vapor uh, membrane and it's not going to allow any moisture to migrate from the warm air out um, into the wall. But in the summertime, it opens up like vortex and it allows vapor to migrate through the wall and gives you dryability, a dryability path inside. Um, so we, we do look at that sort of thing. It's kind of helpful to understand that quite well, right? It's a great piece of the calculator. And then just a little plug for these guys who put a lot of work into this. This is where you can go to find it. And if you can get your relative, uh, your relative humidity and, and temperature locations in your area, you can then compare it into, you know, the Canadian climate, right? Mm -hmm. The next one is water, water everywhere. We have to deal with water and we don't do a good enough job on it. So what is your water management plan? Um, like I said, you get the poop sandwich if you don't care for it, right, Aaron? Right? Mm -hmm. So we do want to make sure that we're dealing with the water, right? And just like changing the old grandbaby's diaper there, you know, fixing a, a, a screwed up wall is not a job you really want to take on, but it's kind of mean to leave it to somebody else. So maybe we should just design it to not happen in the first place. Now, Dr. Joe Stebrick, he's one of the leaders in this in, in, in the world. And so I, I, I love this little quick reference from, from Dr. Joe. And uh, rain is the single most important factor to control in order to construct a durable building, he says. And I've been to his seminars and he's talked about you know, how you end up with spalling a brick and everything like that if you don't properly get the water away from the building, off the brick, that sort of thing. So his fundamentals for rainwater control are drain the site, slope the grade away from the building, then drain the ground, that's foundation perimeter drain, then drain the building, which is your roof system. Overhangs are actually really important. All those, um, you know, um, parapet walls that folks really love, you got to make sure you're getting the water past and around it. If you're putting in a parapet wall, it can really cause you a lot of grief. And then drain the assembly, that's your drainage plane or your weather resistant barrier, and then your water management system involved with that. And then drain the opening, that's your pan flashing. Then you gotta make sure the component can drain so it's not gonna hold water inside of it. And then of course that's draining the material as well. So 
Uh, I just see this screwed up so often when I'm out on job sites. It, it's just shocking how bad it is. Um, and I'm assuming that it's fairly similar in, in the States for some of the job sites I've visited down there. I did look to be that um, even guys using Tyvek will screw this up. And I'll admit, you know, in years past, we used to do this. But there's this really cool product you can get now called Quick Flash. And for, you know, maybe a couple hundred bucks more on the whole home, you can pick different size flashing membranes. They have a nice rubberized gasket. So it's got some flexibility, allows you to move the thing around, right? And get her done, man. Because you know what happens when you do the foam on the outside like this? The foam hardens to a rigid surface. And then, you know, guess what? You know, it's going to pull away from the, the uh, metal flange that you've got there and it's not connected anymore. And you know what happens? If air can get in, so can water, right? So the, the right-hand side is a far better approach. The left-hand side, we used to do that. We got away from it years ago because of failures. Uh, it's what's called, it was a nice try, right? Mm -hmm. But you know what Yoda said, right? Do or do not, there is no try. The That's left was a nice try, but it doesn't work. Don't right. do it. And what was the, what's the flashing manufacturer that you use there on the right? Uh, there's a couple of them out there, but quick flash. Mm -hmm. If you go to the construction instruction uh, website or their app and look for flashing, you'll find out about it and they'll have a link and they'll have installation guides on how to actually install this. It's not really hard, but especially if you're dealing with a bit of a language barrier on site and a, and a video can help you with that. It, it's a really great app to help get all your guys trained to be on site. Um, now, DuPont Tyvek, also uh, one of the, the companies that we use for their wraps, they have some tapes and that sort of thing that you can use as well. You can see we are using their tape system to, to put this quick flash in, but it's this is critically important. You know, it, it really, I see this screwed up so often. And if you get any type of reverse slope on that or any type of wind loading on that, you've got water coming into that wall. And the problem is you don't know it. Right. You don't know it until the wall's rotted. Now you're long gone as the builder, but your homeowner is going to get dinged with it, right? Yeah. The next one is windows. These, this just kills me, windows. I, I still see builders doing this on the left. And it's like, how the heck do you flash that whatsoever when you've got an OSB wall there, right? Yeah. Like you didn't even make the attempt of having like tar. This guy was using tar paper. He didn't even have the tar paper on, right? How do you connect that? You can't. This is just a future rotted wall. Right. And then we wonder why we get class action lawsuits about wood rot in, in, in house assemblies, right? Mm. But you know what? For a, a hundred bucks more, maybe 200 bucks, depending because the costs have gone up now, butyl tapes and some flashing is a really great way to go. So um, Tyvek, DuPont Tyvek's got a great layout on it. Again, construction instructions got some great apps on how to do it. But effectively, you know, you want to have that tiny bit of slope in your sill to the outward. And then you're going to have your pan flash on the bottom, your corner flash to get up over the sides. I always use a window that's got a flange extension on it because it's just way easier to connect it in. You tape your flange extension to the sides. The Tyvek is up at the top until you tape the top and then you drop the Tyvek down over top of it. So it's nicely shingled, right? Mm -hmm. And I've had so many builders say, oh, it's a pain in the ass. It's too hard to do. I can't, I, I can't be bothered with that. It's just, it's not worth it. Uh, two Puerto Rican grandmas in an hour. I taught them how to do it. Uh, one barely spoke English, the other one didn't speak English. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me it's hard. Right. Just don't tell me it's hard. I'm not buying. Right. It, just get it done. You have to be able to do it. Right. So do you flash your windows in any proper possible way or do you flash them like the guy on the left? That's the question. <laughs> all right. Again, hopefully, I, hopefully we get all yeses. <laughs> <laughs> um, Again, the construction instruction app, you go to uh, www.constructioninstruction.com. And um, like I said, if you got anybody that's out there, you're, you're struggling with your guys understanding it, or if there's a language barrier of any sort, yay. Oh, that's outstanding. That does not happen when I'm in Canada. 100%. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay, I'm going to get and off I, my soul. I agree with you. I agree with you. On the, I've, I've used the CI app and I download that video. And I'll send the link to that video to the guys installing the windows. And then I go out. The first window's going in. I, me or a project manager, somebody's got to be on site and sign off on that first window and make sure everyone's done correctly. I've even done mock-ups, right? 
yeah. if need be, do a mock-up. Just yeah. build a frame, put a window on it, show them how to do it, right? Right. We've even done a mock-up where it's been carried around the sites. Here, look at this, right? right. We've had one framing oh. crew that got really good at it. We had them go teach the other framing crews, you know? Yeah. And it goes back to, if you don't do that correctly, what the heck's your air leakage going to look like out of that opening? It's, it's not just the air leakage, it's the rotting wall. Uh, yeah, no, besides the obvious rotting wall. Huh, it's but not, I, Aaron, I see it all over the place. It's crazy. Oh my gosh, that's that's horrible. Well, everyone please change. Anyway, let's see if we can't help with the solar install because there's some okay. really fun things that we need to look at. Right. So trying to click, here we go. So solar ready. This is what I said about mapping our roofs. So this is actually right from our software program. We did a little uh, output print of it, but this is actually showing where all the solar panels are going to be right down to the point where we dictate where the heck you're going to have your uh, roof uh, penetrations from your trades. Sure. Like we tell them this is where you're going, right? Uh, and, and now it's important to understand where roughly it's going to go, um, but you have to account for it because you're going to lose solar if you don't, right? This is a nice big roof, lots of, lots of space, right? Um, we first started doing solar thermal back in 2008. In fact, we wrote the very first spec for all of Canada, for Natural Resources Canada, for doing solar ready. So we've been at this for quite a while. Um, Intercan since updated the guides. If you're looking for a really great guide, there's one listed right at the bottom here. Uh, it's available for anybody, Canada, UNAS, doesn't matter for download. Um, but we actually helped to do the original design of that. And then I've been an editor of it over the years to help people with uh, improving their, their designs, right? So we, yeah, we, we've been doing it. And what I think is critical thinking is actually looking at the design of the roof before you build the home and make sure that the solar will work. It's really tough to do it afterwards, right? And we've actually had to scrap some roofs in the past. No, this one isn't working, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it saves an awful lot of headaches. It's way cheaper to do it on the computer than it is to do it later, right? Mm -hmm. And over the years, we've done you know quite a few solar PV installs. We're actually looking at... Uh, one of our next sites coming up is going all electric, which we're going to talk about electric furnaces next week as well, but going all electric with uh, unlimited amount of solar PV on the roof, right? Nice. But look at this roof. Oh my God, could you have hacked this thing up any worse, right? This was a just a fantastic or orientation for solar gain, but you had all of these roof uh, vents on the very top. You had ventilation for your bathrooms uh, partway up, and then you had four skylights. So you can, you can fit about a fourth of the solar on this roof of what you should be able to, right? So when you're looking um, when you're looking at this, oh, and don't forget, there's also the bump out on the, on the left-hand side of this. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at your roof, you really wanna optimize what's my greatest orientation? Can I get the solar on it? So actually pre-designing the solar into it and avoid stuff like this. Yeah, those, those uh, sun uh, dormers, they're nice, right? The solar skylights, the, except for that they leak and they're really not usually as good a quality. They're improving, but um, they tend to cause grief and they take up space. And that roof space is valuable. Just, just think of it as gold, right? So everything we want to do, we want to look at that. So could we have uh, maybe put our um, vents for our bathrooms? Now, this is a semi-detached home, so there's actually a common wall in between. But could we have brought the vents closer? They were about 10 foot apart. They didn't need to be. They could have come in closer to the edge. Um, probably get rid of the skylights. And then in this particular case, could we have gone with ridge venting or could the vents gone to a different roof plane that was less important? So they could have maybe gone on the upper side ridge instead at the very top uh, or flipped it to the other side of the ridge if that was the less, less good side for solar. So it just depends. I mean, you know, if it's on the front of the home, people are saying, well, I want all my stuff off the front, so I got a pretty roof line. But you got to build net zero, right? Mm -hmm. So you do have to start making some considerations for where stuff goes on that. So the option would be go to a ridge vent then, right? There's no reason why you couldn't go to a ridge vent and make that happen, right? Um, what about if we're into towns? Okay, so we got a hip roof on the ends and the, the end units maybe don't have enough space. Can we optimize our roof by going all gables? Let's say that that was a rear yard facing south or west. I would take that bet, right? You, you could probably do that. Now, uh, the hip roof on the left-hand side, the one that's facing uh, west with the south on the, on the, on the right-hand side, that would be fine but it's the one on the north north hand side that may not have enough. Now in our particular uh, area where we are, we're on latitude 42. We actually have sun north of us in the, uh, 
in the summertime for about two months. So north is actually still in play for us where we are. We can, we can actually get some pretty good gains. The other one is offset roof design. So do a, a disproportionate pitch, right? Yeah. We've got yeah. you know more space on the higher orientation. And that's, that's an alternative to look at as well. We're actually starting to get into some single single slope like shed style roofs, mm -hmm. uh, not a hot roof. We're just we're building a, a large triangle, right? Uh, where we're putting more of our pitch on, especially with the tiny homes. We'll be doing it there, but also I think one of our apartment buildings coming up is using that concept as well. So when you're looking at semis or towns or stack towns or merbs, you've got a very amount of limited amount of roof space. You've kind of got a bit get a bit creative. And this is where you start getting into um, what, what's coming up out of the roof and can we eliminate it from the design inside? And we'll get into a little bit more of that later on next time. Um, but for example, if you have to put in um, a radon stack, where we are, they'll allow us to go outside uh, through the vent, uh, through the, uh, through the, the uh, belt, right? Through the, the belt plate. The sill plate. Yeah. The ridge, the ridge, ridge uh, I can't think right now, dude. Sorry, the rim joist. Okay. Sorry, rim joist. Okay. Yes. You can, go, you can go out through the sill and then up the side of the house. Yeah. Is a, well, we don't even have to do that. We just have to get it out of the house. Okay. okay. Um, but as opposed to trying to do uh, the stack, right? And I'm concerned about doing the stack because there's a couple of issues, but I, I cover that off when I talk about radon. But anyway, yeah, there's different options. So we really want to carefully look at what's going up through the roof when we get into these guys and and try and limit the, the amount you're getting hit with, right? Um, what about when South and West is not available or if there's not enough space? So will they allow, uh, architectural restrictions allow solar panels on the South and will people accept it? Um, so on the front of the building is what I'm saying. Is there room for vertical wall panels facing West or South that can be added? We're actually looking at that on a couple of apartment units. And can covered decks be added using solar panels as the roof covering? So. You know, can you, can you, you know, in a building, you might see carports that are solar, um, same concept on putting on a covered deck that has solar panels on it. Yeah. You can gain quite Doug, a few you, design it right. Doug, have you looked at solar shingles from, uh, I guess we got Tesla, GAF Energy and Ergo Sun all coming? Uh, we, we can't get them. Um, okay. They're, they're just, they're, they're not, uh, well, COVID's really screwed a lot of that up. Yeah, that's right. Man, right. But we, we have not really been able to get them. We've looked at them. Their, their output isn't quite as good. Uh, I know Gord Cook did in his cottage, he did built-in shingles that look quite nice, mm -hmm. uh, but their capacity was a fair bit less as well. So um, no, we haven't, but it's not been for lack of trying. It's been for lack of availability to try. Yeah, yeah. I think that's something to, to definitely consider. A lot of new products coming on the market in the next six months. A absolutely. Again, uh, one of your early guys to the table should be your solar contractor who understands solar design and loading, right? You right. may really need that. So our guy is uh, Will Beardmore from Blue Water Energy, a uh, great guy to work with. He'll basically take the same design I did. He'll mimic it, make sure that I'm right on my solar uh, loading. And then he'll give me the calculations about what, what I need. So I'm not going to really spend a lot of time on this because I know we're short on time. But the design process, it has to look at your solar gains look at the initial roof design, does it work? Does your math hold for what you think you can fit on the roof? And, uh, and is he able to model it? Is your, uh, your solar evaluator able to model it to say, yes, you're gonna get enough solar? It is important for your energy advisor, by the way, to have told you what your gains are, what your loads are on the house for heating and cooling and occupant, right? right. And your solar designer needs to know that to say, okay, well, if I need 40 gigajoules, can I hit 40 gigajoules? So you need to know, is it 40 or is it 32 or is it 50? That's an important number to know. That's why I say we start with that and then way simpler and cost effective to correct the roof during the design stage than once you started building it, right? Uh, here's the design phase. This is some of the connecting points that we have to look at. I'm not gonna get into it, uh, but a key consideration as well on this is, and a lot of guys miss this, is to allow extra loading on the roof. Uh, the roof. So when we're looking at our truss design, we, we dump an extra five pounds of, of uh, roof load uh, per square foot onto the top quarter of the truss and we do it around the roof so we don't really care about orientation the truss is just designed that way um, but a lot of guys miss that and it's an important point because you are adding load to the roof depending on your engineer uh, and your municipality they may not let you scab directly into the top of the, the cord 
it may require that you put a scab on the side and load into the scab with your connectors. And the reason for that is, is because if you, if you actually run the modeling on the truss, you can blow up the truss loading to a point where it fails by simply screwing into the top part of the truss, depending on what you've designed into it. So that's why the extra loading is important, right? And then you've got to look at penetration. So this is on the side of a, one of our homes from a few years ago. And, and what we want to do is we want to make sure that we've put in sleeves. Remember how I was doing that really nice water management detail? Yeah. Well, your, your, your solar guy, he's going to need a couple of sleeves here. So it's nice if you actually rough in the sleeves and cap them. Even on, on the net zero ready, solar ready part of it, um, it just makes it a whole lot easier. And that also means that in the house, you want to have a direct conduit line from your mechanical room up to the attic so that your guy can get up there and work. And that right. means that you can't be mean, Aaron. You can't put the, the solar conduit right out at the outside edge of the roof and the guy can't get in there except for crawling on his belly. Right. That's not nice. You're in insulation, right? So it's got to be far enough inside of the roof that he's actually able to, to at least yeah. approach to get yeah. out, right? Well, I think it's good advice there. What you said is that really the best practice is all penetration should be made before you're putting the brick on. Everybody's got to get their penetrations in and you got to own the hole, right? Own the hole, just cap the darn thing, but at least it's there. Yeah. Now, if you are going full solar, then there's the potential that you don't have to run the conduit. I kind of still like the conduit, it's a metal conduit, right? I kind of still like the conduit so that you don't have anybody that's, you know, screwing a um, oversized screw in for hanging a, 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 a picture on the wall and you run it right into your, because that would be bad, eh? Yeah. You don't, you don't want to hit right into a live electrical wire. So I still am a, a believer that even if you know you're running a thing, it's better to have the conduit in place. That would be my safety advice, if you will. Uh, and then you've got to have room for your inverter because, you know, depending on where you go, they can be inside or outside, but we do have to look at that and it's got to be commissioned as well. So um, we provide monitoring software that enables the occupant to be aware of their energy usage. I think that that's a really critical piece. Uh, it's also important for customers to understand some important points such as emergency shutdown, how their utility building will work and how and who to call in the event of an issue. So. We want to make sure that they've got a fairly simple to follow package in that case when they're doing full solar uh, for the net zero. And then uh, the monitoring, we want to know where the energy is being used. And so they can have a, a dashboard monitor for following this. So um, pretty cool that you can have this. It's important to ensure we have a conduit to attic, like I said, as well as the, uh, the location of the conduit. But we also want to make sure we're providing uh, that dashboard monitor system available to the client. Typically, it's going to be uh, Wi-Fi based, and they can yeah. just go on there and download the app and follow along. And you find that they'll actually use less energy if they if they do that. Doug, are you upgrading your service panels just as a matter of course because of the zero energy or net zero house? Yeah, we pretty much had to go to 200 amp. Um, yeah. But we're also we put in a rough in into our garage for electric vehicle charging. Nice. Um, so it's it's already predetermined that you can put both of those in. So we had to pretty much go to 200 amp. Not very often we've had to see us going higher than that. And we haven't really got into a lot of the smart panels yet, although we are investigating that. And I think yeah. that that's something down the road that, you know, because you're not using all the energy all the time. A lot of this is actually overkill when you actually look at the energy loads. So uh, smart panels are definitely the wave of the future. And we yeah. are looking at that in our apartment buildings right now. I think we we saw some presentations uh, the past couple months from Schneider Electric on a new smart panel that they have and the Wiser Energy System. And that monitors everything in the house. And it, it, it's it's an area to keep an eye on. If smart panels are coming. They're here. Yeah. Uh, so check it out. We've, we've been doing it. We're just, uh, we haven't moved to smart panels, but we do the energy modeling. We've been doing it for, for a couple of years now, quite, quite a few years actually. Um, but if the ultimate goal is selling net zero, and this is where I think you guys in the States do a way better job than we do of really drilling down on the total cost of ownership. And, uh, and Gene Myers is great at this, by the way, yeah. him and his company. Um, but we don't really have the benefit of green mortgages that help our, our clients along. So when you're looking at the, the whole net zero equation, and there's those extra solar panels and trying to convince people that this is the right way to go. I get back to that argument I talked about last week. Well, if it's so good, then how come it's not included, right? And so where we, I think as an industry, especially in Canada, is we need to do a better job of sharing the conversation about the dollars and where it's going and how it's cost effective to include it. So um, 
there might be incentive programs in your area. Um, I really don't know for sure in the States what all is available. That's where your energy raters got to earn their dollars, right? They need to be able to help you with that. Um, but I am concerned that in Canada, we need to do a better job of, uh, and I'm not a huge fan of incentivizing, but I, I do think it's important, guys, if you're, if you're wanting to, I'll tell you what's going to incentivize, the fact that gas is going to jump like crazy. Have you heard the pricing happening with gas right now? Natural gas, I mean. Yeah. It's, uh, it's up an insane and, amount. And it already happened with propane, right? But now it's happening with natural gas. Yeah, because there's not enough, believe it or not, there's not enough supply and there's too much demand because all these countries are switching to LNG uh, yeah. to offset their, their coal, right? So the end consumer house user, it's going to just skyrocket over the next couple of years. So I, I think my equation in Canada is not going to matter. And it'll be the same for the states that gas is just going to get really expensive and we're going to have to really limit our use of it. Right. And I don't want to be a doom and gloom guy, but it's something we've got to consider. Right. Mm -hmm. So I guess we're into our final question. Uh, are your clients asking for PV solar panels? And then the second one is, what's the biggest challenge you're facing uh, when trying to sell PV panels? The price and budget, uh, homeowner lack of knowledge, homeowner fear of new technology, like is it going to catch on fire? I hear that one. Homeowner skeptical about the PV benefits. We really have a tough time with that in Canada because of the math. Uh, builder lack of effective selling marketing tools. The aesthetics, I don't want this on the front of my house, right? There's things like yeah. that. Doug, on the PV solar panel question, we had 60% no and 40% yes. 40% is not bad. That's that's uh, starting to be some market penetration then, right? That's for sure. Uh, we'll throw the next poll up here. And this is what is the biggest challenge you're facing when trying to sell PV panels. Uh, price budget coming in, homeowner lack of PV knowledge coming in, builder lack of effective selling marketing tools. Yeah, uh, that's that's us in Canada. Yeah, we uh, we we just we don't do the math well. Homeowner skeptical of PV benefits. By the way, I just filmed a video on my own experience with PV for my house. So I there's certain benefits that uh, are based on the state that I live in, but boy, it can be a no-brainer depending on the benefits that you get from your federal and state and utility. Yeah, we're, we're actually looking at going all electric on one of our next subdivisions coming up and it's being driven by the, the towns where it's like, I don't have space to put uh, gas in because of the penetrations. Yeah. It's not the gas, you know, wouldn't necessarily work for heating and cooling. It's, I don't have the space for the penetrations. Yeah. So it's, it's forcing our hand to go all, all electric, right? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, we're kind of getting up on the clock here. I'm almost done. So the takeaways today is um, how big do you need to build? Really start to look at you know, things like um, the not so big house movement. There's some great information there. Uh, basements are a great value added space, by the way. And we'll get into basements next week a little bit more. Consider how the clients will use their home. Beware of complicated wall detailing. Air sealing, get it under one. I've got it 1.5 here, but really it needs to be under one. Yeah. For, for net zero, right. Understand effective R value and window impact. Don't get confused by just, wow, I've got lots of insulation on my wall and then pick a crappy window. It doesn't work. Right. And yeah. then plan your solar design early, minimally before permit uh, is even started. Right. Yeah. And the, and the other two I would maybe add just from, from talking to you is um, get an energy advisor, energy rater on your team. Right do off it. the bat. Do it now. And, yeah. and the other no brainer is, you can in Canada and the United States, you can sign up for the zero energy ready home program. And that is such a great guide. There's some great marketing tools there. There's some great tools for how to sell solar to your clients. So whether you're uh, NAHB or CHAB or CHBA, you, you can join those programs. It doesn't cost anything. I don't think in Canada either. Does it, Doug? I don't think so. No, no. So those are great programs to be a part of. Absolutely. And then, of course, I must say thank you to Eva for uh, allowing me to present this today. Really appreciate it. And thanks well, to everybody for attending. Yeah, and we obviously huge thanks to you, Doug, and, and sharing your knowledge and your expertise. And I think it, you know, so much value in, uh, in each of these sessions. I'm, I'm taking notes furiously here on my end. So <laughs> hopefully everybody... Well, we're supposed to share the slide deck so people can actually get a copy oh, of it too. So. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's Aaron, thanks for hanging out with me. I think we're over oh, time. I apologize. I talked a lot today, but you were asking some great questions. And so I was, I was having a blast, man. Sorry. Yeah. Well, fantastic. We'll look forward to seeing everyone in the next session. Outstanding. Very cool, dude.